Amen. Hey, thank you for uh, praying for me. We want you to know that our team continues uh, to pray uh, for you guys. If you guys don't know, my name is Rick. I get to be uh, the lead pastor. If you are newer here, though, I would love to personally connect with you after this service. If you're in the Cranston location, I'm going to be outside under the portico. If you have time to introduce yourself, I'd love uh, to be able to meet you. South County, thank you for continuing to show up down there. And those of you who join us online, um, when you let us know how to pray for you, I want you to know that we uh, continue to pray uh, for you as well. Well, today um, I am excited that we get to kick off a brand new teaching series called How to Survive in an Upside Down World. I know some of you have been sitting there thinking, why in the world is everything upside down on the stage, right? Well, that's why. (laughs) Because, you know, we live, uh, it's to go with the teaching theme, right? And you're wondering, whose genes are those? No, those aren't my genes, in case you're wondering. They wanted me to hang from upside down and see if I could teach. Teach. And I'm like, no, I can do a treadmill and teach. I can't hang upside down and teach. But here uh, today, I want us to, to get us to go down this road. All of you who are older, uh, and I'm kind of like in that category now, um, those of us who are older, I want you to think back to when you were in elementary school. All right? And so um, think back to when you're like first, second, and third grade. And do you remember uh, when they had fire drills in your school? Do you remember that? Do you remember? I, I used to love this. I can remember right where I, at this time we're in Indiana, Modoc, Indiana, and um, we would have these fire drills. And I would love it because it gave us a break from class, right? Because class is so boring. Sit behind the desk, right? But we got to actually the, the alarm would go off, some excitement was happening, but everybody had to be so quiet. Do you remember that? And then the teacher would have you all line up and. And then um, you got to go outside. I love being outside. And we got to go outside. And as I'm walking, I'm thinking, you know what? At recess, I'm doing that. You know, I'd see the recess, all the playground equipment, right? I'd think about what I'm going to do at recess time as we're out there. And, and in, in Indiana, not only did we have fire drills, you, you might not have had experienced this. We had to have tornado drills. Have you? Did anybody ever have a tornado drill? Okay, yeah, some of you have. Okay, yeah. So um, they would have tornado uh, drills, and sometimes, and I, I was trying to think about why was sometimes it different. Sometimes we'd go, like go underneath our desk. They'd have us in the classroom, go underneath our desk, and you would uh, get up in a little ball, and then you'd put your hands behind your head around your neck, and you would have to hold that position until the teacher would say, "Okay, it's over." But sometimes they'd have us go out to the hall hallway and um, in the hallway and line up and as I, I don't know if it depends on which way the tornado was coming you know and it depends on which wall or whatever but sometimes we'd line up in the hall get down in the same position and, and hold uh, that position but here's what I want you to think about I want you to think about how upside down our world is today because our kids are growing up in a world where they have school intruder drills Right, that's upside down. You know, in 2022, just this past year, there are over 300 school shootings on school grounds. And that's just K to 12. To, over 300, or 300, they're recorded. 300 recorded. In 2021, there are 250 recorded. Compare that just to a little over a decade ago in 2010 when there were only 15. Do you see how fast our world has become upside down? Some of the young kids who are growing up now, that's the only world they know. That's not upside down to them. That's just the world they live in. But to those of us who have been around a little bit longer, to us, that's like upside down. We live in a world where Wrong is right, and right is wrong. We live in this upside down world, and there's no better example than Daniel to look at how Daniel lived his life. And so, over the next 12 weeks, as we explore this idea, of how do we survive in an upside down world, we're going uh, to look at the example of Daniel. So will you take your Bibles and go to the book of Daniel? It's in the Old Testament. 
You'll find, uh, find Psalms that's about in the middle, but keep on going towards the New Testament. You'll hit Ezekiel. And then after Ezekiel, you'll find Daniel. And Daniel, um, this is Daniel's story. Um, as we read it, it's going to be read in the third person. Uh, they believe that Daniel was the author. He's the one who's writing this, and he, but he's not writing it in first person. He's writing it in a third person. And as we read through this... I want us to understand how Daniel survived in this upside down world. And as you continue to think about this world, and there are many, many examples we could give that would show that we live in an upside down world. I want us to think about the idea of the world that we live in now and how we have lost the art of respecting each other. That's just another example of how upside down we are in this world. We've lost the art to actually respect one another. Um, So many people who call Hope Church their home are employed by the school system. And we hear this from them. We, we hear how in the, the, there's no respect for the teacher. There's no respect for the authority. There's no re- respect for each other. And our world continues to go down this road. I've even talked to some uh, guys who are older who used to be involved in organized crime. And even those guys will say, they'll tell you this, you talk to them, they'll tell you, even in organized crime, they've lost respect. There used to be lines that they wouldn't cross. Yeah, we're laughing at that. That's how upside down our world is. But they're like, now there's like no respect. There's no lines that they won't cross. And I'm just like, it's another example of an upside down world. If you're a Christ follower, if you are a Christ follower, but you're new and you're younger, and this is the only culture that you have known, You may not realize how upside down your world is because you haven't been in the scriptures long enough. You you haven't taken in enough of God's word to understand what it means to live as a Christ follower and to see how upside down our world is compared to how God has called us to live. And this is where we find Daniel. Daniel, um, we find him at a time when his world has been flipped. In fact, um, uh, to understanding the context, this is like one of the exiles. Um, they are exiled from Jerusalem, meaning they are captured and dragged, uh, um, they are dragged unwillingly to Babylon. And here... They're ripped away from everything that they know is their world. They're ripped away from their family. They're ripped away from how they would worship God. And today, what I want us to do, I want us to walk away as we explore chapter one. I want us to walk away with this big idea. That God's faithfulness isn't proven by my circumstances but by who God is in my circumstances. Because isn't it true that every time that our world gets flipped upside down, we think, God, where are you? I thought you were a good God. We start questioning the faithfulness of God. We start questioning the love of God. We start questioning the goodness of God. Every time, I mean, we have a bad day. And we're like, God, I thought you were good. How come you can allow me to have a bad day? No, he's never promised that you're not going to have a bad day or a bad week, a bad month, or a bad year. He's never promised that. But what he has promised, that even in your bad days, bad month, or a bad year, in your bad circumstances, he has promised to show up. He has promised to walk with you. He has promised to lead and to guide you on a daily basis. That's what he has promised. And so God's faithfulness isn't proven by how upside down our world becomes. It's proven by who he is in our circumstances.
And here we have the example of Daniel to walk through. Go to verse number one, and we'll talk a little bit about the context. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So we're talking ancient history. We're talking that the king over the southern part of Israel, over Judah, that there came a point when a king from 1,700 miles from the east went west to expand his kingdom and he conquers Jerusalem. He besieges it, like he surrounds it. And he goes in and captures all these Jewish people and starts dragging them 1,700 miles back to their home city. This is Daniel telling us this story. He lived this. Now, what Daniel wants us to know, because much of chapter 1 is like a summary. He, wants to, he, he starts this off giving us an understanding of who God is. Because if somebody had, uh, to be able, was able to, uh, to point the finger at God and say, God, how are you faithful to your people? It would have been Daniel. And it would have been the people that he's running with. Now, also, please make note of this. Daniel is a teenager. Students, we got some teenagers in here. He's like your age when all this happens to him, when his world gets flipped upside down. Students, has your world been flipped upside down? Have you been one of those students who's lost a peer, you know, one of your buddies at school? Have you been one of those students who has suffered a, a family split in your world? Just got flipped upside down. Daniel is a great model for you. Watch how Daniel responds when his world gets turned upside down. And here he's Daniel and many other teenagers are being separated from their family. And they're going to be indoctrinated in a whole new culture that was so foreign to them. But here's what Daniel wants us to know. Look at verse number two. And the Lord gave him victory. The him isn't Daniel. The him isn't the king of Israel. The him is the king, uh, this pagan king, King Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel wants us to know that God is still sovereign. That even in an upside down world, even in the worst of your worst circumstances, that God is still in control. And Daniel says, but God gave him that pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, victory over God's chosen people, King Jehoiakim. God gave him victory. Now, we see that even in this bad circumstance, we see the faithfulness of God. Because if you dive in a little bit deeper in here, and if you go back about a hundred years, and in um, the prophet Isaiah, there was a time when Isaiah was looking at King Hezekiah, who was king over Israel. And this was a prophecy from Isaiah. In Isaiah 39 and verse number 6, Isaiah looks at King Hezekiah and says, There is a time coming when everything in your palace, all the treasures stored up by your ancestors until now, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing left, nothing will be left, says the Lord. That's a hundred years before this event ever took place. And Isaiah, uh, because God had told him to tell the king this, that this is what's going to happen, and now that time is upon these people. See, God is being faithful to who he is. Why? Because he had called the people of Israel to live out their faith in a certain way, and they weren't. They were rebelling. They weren't following. They were following the other gods of their culture. So God's going to be faithful to his word. And when, when the people of Israel were breaking the covenant with God and he gave them time and time and time and and just in this one instance over a hundred years to get it right and they didn't get it right then he brings upon them God's faithful and righteous judgment 
And that's what we see. Let's go back to verse number two. The Lord gave him victory, King Nebuchadnezzar, victory over Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him, permitted this pagan king to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. Now remember, the temple in Jerusalem was everything. That represented the presence and the power of God. And ancient history, that's what these temples represented about the gods that they worship. So Nebuchadnezzar took took them back, took some of these sacred objects that were in the temple and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Not only do we see the faithfulness of God in permitting this pagan king to do this, we see the humility of God. The humility of a God who really is in control, but he's willing to be humble because he's going to be faithful and he's going to allow this pagan king to come in with his pagan God and make it look like that he has won the day. Think about this. He's bringing this stuff back to his god Marduk. Now, um, that's who most believe that that was the god of Nebuchadnezzar in the time of the Babylonian period. These are some sketch renderings of what that god may have looked like, what that temple may have looked like. But now those, those sacred items that were in the temple in Jerusalem are now being brought back to this god, little g, and to that temple. And now it appears to the known world at that time that the God of Marduk now reigns and rules over this Jewish God who has been proclaimed the God of all gods, the God of creator, the universe, of everything. And it looks like, it looks like Marduk has won the day. That's what everybody is thinking. And I want us to think about the gospel. And didn't it look like that? We just saying death was arrested. And that time when Jesus was nailed to the cross, those rulers at that time thought, finally, finally, we've shut this guy up who keeps on saying he's the Messiah. We put him in a tomb and they're finally like good riddance of him. But what happened? It wasn't over. It was on that third day, right? That a whole new set of problems came along and that Jesus actually proved and he overcame death. He overcame the grave to show that he really is still in control and just like the gospel God is still in control even in ancient history in Daniel's time and he's still in control no matter how out of control it seems like our world is in so we can rest in him now let's go back to uh, uh, Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 3 Here's what happens next. He kind of gives us this overview. He says, And then king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to, the ba- uh, to Babylon as captives. And, and what if you kept on reading, what you would see is what the king does is he gathers all the, the best of the best out of the captives of Jer- uh, Jerusalem, brings them to Babylon, and he's going to indoctrinate, indoctrinate them with all of their cultural learnings, how they view science, how they uh, bl- uh, do a magic, how, how they uh, view wisdom. He's going to indoctrinate them in all the ways of Marduk, their their God. And he's going to do this for three years out of, out of, you know, who knows how many. A lot more than what we are told here. We're going to see four in just a second. But there, there are several. And out of these, over a period of three years, and then the king will come and see who rises to the top. And whoever rises to the top out of this, then will be invited to serve along the side of King Nebuchadnezzar. And his staff. And what Daniel does is this gives us a peek at four of them. And so if you slide down to verse number six, it says, Daniel 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen from all the tribe of Judah. Now, not just being indoctrinated. Think about this. Your world gets upside down. You're ripped away from your family, from everything that you know to be normal, put into this whole new culture, and then they go and they rename you. They give you a new name. So they take their Jewish names and they give them these pagan names. Every one of these names has a root that ties back to Marduk or one of their gods of their time. And so Daniel was called Belsajar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, and and Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. And as all this is happening to them, I love what we read in verse number eight. Look what happens in verse number eight. Daniel was determined not to devile himself. Daniel, just to zero in on that phrase, Daniel was determined. Some of your uh, scriptures uh, and uh, translations may say Daniel purposed in his heart. The idea is that he was intentional. The idea that he was going to draw a line somewhere. And this is where he draws that line. And let me assure you that Hope Church has drawn some lines according to the scriptures. Our lines will always be pointing back to the scriptures and the biggest one is that the line that we have drawn is that no one, no outside force, no government agency, no whoever will ever come into Hope Church and say, this is what you have to teach or you can't teach this anymore. That's our line. You cannot mess with the gospel, the good news of God's word. You can't mess with that. And that's the line that we have drawn. But as we look at Daniel, I wonder what we can learn from him about an example that we need to draw some lines in our life. Notice that how intentional that he is in the very beginning of all this to point out to us that he had to make a decision for himself to draw a line that he knew he wasn't going to cross so that he could hold on to that part of him who is following God. Do you have those lines drawn for your life? Are there some definite lines that you're like, we as a family will never do this. As a person, we will never do this because, it, because God's word tells us that we need to live differently. And we're not going to cross that line. Do you have those kinds of lines where you have determined, where you have made a choice We all can learn from Daniel. And when you choose ahead of time, it makes it so much easier. Students, listen to me. He's a a teenager. And this teenager is saying, ahead of time, I'm going to make some choices, some lines that I'm not going to cross. I'm not going to cross this in my friendships. I'm not going to cross this in my romantic relationships. I'm not going to cross these lines. How uh, Parents, how I handle my money, I'm not going to cross this line. And here's how I'm going to handle myself with integrity at my job. These are lines that I'll not cross. These are the types of things. That God would call us to, according to his word, to live our life by. And look what happens when when we live like that. And I think this is important. Daniel's such a great example for this. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. Hesed is the Hebrew word that, that where the translators came up with translated into the English of respect and affection. And you know what hesed is? It's a very powerful Hebrew word. And it has this, that there, it implies that there's a mutual respect and love for each other. Daniel is living in a culture that is so pagan, so far from God, and yet he's finding favor. He's, he has respect for them as people because the image of God is stamped on them even though they hold a different opinion than they have. And he can still respect them and have a love for them, and it was mutual. See, Daniel, he wasn't looking to pick a fight. He was looking to be a light. And this is exactly how he lived his life among the government officials. 
And God would call us to live our life. How we can learn from an example like Daniel. There's so much for us as Christ followers that we can apply to our life and how we carry ourselves and how we can still have our boundaries. We can still draw our land. We can still determine in our heart we're going to follow God and still have friends and still have a love and a respect for others who see it a different way. And who knows, God may give you opportunity one after the other to share with them why you see the world like you do. And that may open the door for them to receive the gospel like you have received the gospel. So what Daniel does here is um, he goes and asks. He asks if he can have um, for 10 days if he could be tested. He, he refuses. He's like, hey, will you just test? Well, I'm not, I don't want to eat any of this, you know, me, me and the, the king's food, this wine. And he's like, will you just test us for 10 days? And, and the response, the immediate response, though, is this from um, that person who's over him. He says, I'm afraid of the Lord, the king. He's scared for his life. And I wonder if that doesn't depict to us where we should have the proper fear, the proper reverence. Remember what God says? He says the, be- uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I wonder if we could model that principle in our, far- in, in our life. That doesn't help us to draw those lines. And that doesn't help us to live differently, help us to survive in an upside down world. Well, he goes through this whole uh, process and, and finally says, hey, will you do, at least do uh, this test? All right. And so he says in verse number 12, he says, please test us for 10 days on this diet of vegetables and water. And at the end of the 10 days, let's see how We look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food and then make the decision in light of what you actually see. Daniel steps out by faith. He didn't know if this was going to work. He he, he had no idea what the outcome would be. But by faith, he's like, hey, me and my buddies do this for 10 days and let's just see what happens. And what happens is that the attendant agreed, right? And you know the story. That they, at the end of that time of testing, they were far above any other of their peers in 10 days. See, God God showed up in very bad circumstances. And God will show up in your bad circumstances. Even though you don't like the outcome, you think Daniel liked being under house arrest? Do you think Daniel liked being dragged 1,700 miles away out of his culture? Do you think he liked it? Absolutely not. But he was still able to see God show up in those circumstances. And so are we. And here's like a summary statement. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. You know what? They, they realized they were leaning into this truth that they had learned. You know what this truth was? Something that we would find in Psalms 46. That God is our refuge. That God is our strength. That God is our help in a time of trouble. And here's these teenager boys putting that principle into practice 1,700 miles from the country, uh, from the city that they had grown up in. You and I can certainly learn that in our upside down world, that in our bad weeks, bad months, or a bad year, that God will still be our refuge. That God will be our strength. He'll give you the strength for that day and focus on that day. And he'll show up and he'll be your help for the time of trouble that you find yourself into. Um, that's, what these, that's what these teenagers found out to be real. And they were leaning into it. And God continued to show up as they trusted by faith 
He continued to show up and his hand was upon them. And here's this other summarizing statement. Whenever the king consulted them, these four, in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them what to be 10 times more capable than any of the others. Because there are others who made it through it. There were others that were invited into this royal service. But these four found themselves, you know, heads, you know, head and shoulders above everybody else in their ability to perform the tasks that were given to them. God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness isn't proven by my circumstances, but by who God is in my circumstances. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Will you take that connection card out of the chair in front of you? Because on there are next steps. And I want to walk you through these next steps. And there's a next step for every person in the room, online, in South County. There's a next step for you. Um, So I want all of us to grab those connection cards. And because this is another way that we can pray for each other. It says, my circumstances are not great. Pray for me to see God's faithfulness in my daily life, despite my circumstances. Now, on that connection card, there's a box one, and um, in not, not any of this wording. You'll find this wording inside your bulletin or if you're online on that app. But if you take that connection card and just check box one, we will know to pray for you in this very specific way. And then I want to invite you where it says prayer requests. If you want us praying specifically for your circumstance, you give us, you know, as much as you can about the details of that circumstance and we will pray for you. Now, if this is where you find yourself, I want to give you a practical step that you can do as a Christ follower that will help you in in these times. And that is this. I will start or I will end my day by writing down how God has been faithful to me in the past. And I'm t- I, you go back as far as you can. And I'm telling you, once you start going to the past, you're going to start going down a rabbit hole, a good rabbit hole. Because you're going to start thinking, oh my goodness, it wasn't just that time. It wasn't just that time that he showed up for my family. It wasn't just that time he showed up just for me. It wasn't just that time that he showed up for the church. You're going to start thinking of all these things, of the ways that God has been faithful to you. And this is just a good practical step to remind yourself when you find yourself in these places wondering, God, are you really faithful? And then you're reminded yourself, oh yeah, you are faithful because I remember when. And just like you were back then, you will be today. So I encourage you to do that. The other next step says this, pray that I'll be more like Daniel. Man, we all need this. Listen, every one of you online and in South County, you need this. Pray that I can be more like Daniel, determined and choosing ahead of time to be faithful to God no matter the situation. Students, you need this. Students, you need to choose ahead of time to be faithful. You need to draw, you need to know the lines that you're going to draw. So when you find yourself, not not um, if, it's going to be when. When you find yourself in that situation, you are already going to know what the choice, the decision, because you purpose, you are intentional, you determined ahead of time. So let me encourage you to let us pray for you in these ways. Will you do that? I hope that you will, because this week when our team gathers, we'll take every one of these connection cards. You take these connection cards and you put them into the offering boxes in the back of this room. If you're online, you can just submit it right online. If you're in South County, give them to Pete or Scott, and Pete and Scott will make sure that we get them and we will pray over each one of these.